Genesis chapter 2, we're beginning a series today entitled The Adams Family, Living Through the Challenge of Family Life. May is our family month. I want to encourage each of you, if you can, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we're going to be covering some very pertinent topics concerning family. And uh, at the end of May, the fourth Sunday, we're not having a Kingdom Living Conference this year. We're going to have Kingdom Living Sunday. We're excited uh, for the Jenkins that will be sharing with us all the way from Cleveland, Ohio. But, uh, so I'm going to share over the next couple of weeks uh, the Adams family. We're going to be examining the first family of the Bible, uh, Adam, Eve, and Cain, and Abel, and Seth. And we're going to uh, dissect them from a variety of things, from courtship uh, to covenant to children, and even how do you manage life after a crisis. Uh, and so all of that will kind of be uh, what we see in Scripture. And so I want to take some time uh, over the next few weeks. It's a four-week series, and so everything we're doing during the week is going to reinforce uh, what we're going to be sharing. So I hope and pray uh, that even if it's not your stage of family, uh, that you would once again embrace uh, what the Word is talking about, and perhaps if you can help someone else that you know you need to hear this teaching. Amen. My pastor has something uh, he wants to talk to you about. All right, Genesis chapter 2, beginning around verse 18. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. They will talk about courtship, and we'll deal with it in the confines of the Adams family. Here it is, beginning of verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. Gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is from bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken from man. It explains why man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. The text says this, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and brought her to the man. The title of desires, I want to kind of put an inquiry on this. I want to tag this thought today. God, is this my rib? Lift those hands toward heaven and say, Lord, speak. We need to hear. You may be seated in the presence of our God. God, is this my rib? We're going to encounter over the next couple of weeks what that looks like. And the Adams family gives us a wonderful picture. God's initial and intentional plan of family. As we go into the book of Genesis, it begins to talk about the reality of creation and how God saw fit to start everything. It's important for us to understand that the Bible gives us some principles, if you will, that allows us to understand how he sees the order of things, and especially when it comes to family, because family, according to Scripture, is the first entity, the first institution that God founded. Before there was a church, before there were schools, before anything else, God founded family. And it is here that we see that being played out. And whenever you read the book of Genesis, it's important to understand uh, that it carries itself a multiplicity of perspectives. Because on one hand, it has given us some symbolism as it gives with us the concept and understanding of what God was trying to get done in the beginning. But also, I believe that it can be applied for us today. So when reading scripture, I'm going to hope help us to, to be able to discern and be able to uh, unmask what the text is saying because for many we get confused and for many of us we bring so many questions to the text. We, we bring so many things and there's nothing wrong with that but understand that for what the Bible was written for is the intent not just the intricacies that God was really trying to for us apart. And as we began to look at that, understand that God in creation, as we read Genesis chapter 1, you can spend time with that. You'll begin to see that it seems in Genesis 1 that there is an initial creation story, how man and woman were created in the image of God. 
And many have been confused because Genesis 2 seems to add a second creation story. But all Genesis 2 was really trying to do was give more, uh, if you will, details to what is explained in Genesis chapter 1. As we began to see God's order of things, how he begins to mandate certain things, how on each day he's creating certain things to make sure uh, that the earth is populated and his greatest creation is humanity. Genesis 1 lets us know that man and woman were both born or both made for the purposes of God. Don't miss that, my brothers and sisters. One of the things that is unique about scripture, especially the Hebrew Bible, is as we began to look at it, it has an emphasis on women that other Near Eastern cultures did not have. The fact that you see both of them mentioned together, men and women, created in the image of God, the Imago Dei, which speaks to us about the reality of how we begin to understand that all of us are born with purpose. Regardless if you're man or woman, God has called us all to a level of purpose. But in Genesis 2, God gets to the place to understand understand that what I need to make sure is happening is that I'm putting them on the trajectory to make sure that not only are they born and created, but that they are operating the purpose that they have. And so when we read Genesis 2, beginning and starting in chapter 2, you'll note that first of all, he creates Adam. And Adam, this name, Adam, it means man from the red, man from the ground, who God creates and breathes his spirit into Adam. And initially when you read Genesis chapter 2, you begin to know that God speaks to Adam. God has to encourage Adam and God gives Adam dominion and authority. Don't miss this because it's important to note that before we see a spouse, before we see a woman, God has spoken to the man and given the man an assignment. His assignment is to have dominion and authority. Don't get that twisted, my brothers and sisters. Before you even forlay and think that you need to be connected with anyone, the Bible gives us the clear way it has to go. You can't get a real without, first of all, having a job. Y'all missed it. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's what happens. So he gives Adam this notion of dominion. He gives Adam this concept of authority. And then all of a sudden our text tells us that God looks at the life of Adam and says, Adam, it's not good that he's alone. Here is what I must admit for us today because the challenge in trying to discern this scripture is no, it was not Adam that went to God and said he's alone. It was God that perceived Adam in his purpose and said, Adam, it's not good that he be alone. Why, my brothers and sisters? Because I, I submit since Adam was so entrenched in purpose, he was not worried about some of his needs. It was only when God revealed them to him did he understand where he could go in God. My brothers and sisters, I want you to know that part of the concept of understanding courtship and family is to understand that at the end of the day, it is God that gives us the right timing. God that lets us know when is the right moment for those things to be manifested. Right. Know what happens here. He says it's not good for him to be alone. So let me create. Let me uh, present to him a helper. I, this word for most oftentimes causes issue. That term helper for many uh, seems to be a, a term of of denigration. It may seem to many uh, to be a term of servanthood, but this term helper is a powerful term. It is a term that Jesus even uses to talk about the Godhead. Here in scripture, helper is how God is defined in scripture. In other words, what we hear, what he's saying about Adam is I'm going to give God, I'm going to give Adam a helper. I'm going to give him divine help that is going to be reminiscent of him having me on earth. Y'all missed it. My, the connection comes because what he's suggesting is that this helper for Adam will be someone that will be paramount to me helping him. This is divine help I'm sending him. And my brothers and sisters, I think that's powerful for us to gather because what he says in this text is that I'm going to give Adam a real. I'm going to give him a helper that that once I connect him with this rib he does not have to worry about help anywhere else yeah. I'm gonna provide everything he needs in this one entity this one rib is what I'm gonna give him. and my brothers and sisters note in this text that when he says it's not good for Adam a man to be alone nobody says he's not saying it's not good because Adam has been alone for a long time this introduction of a rib 
was not based on time, but based on purpose. Y'all missed it. Okay, um, I'm submitting today that most of us are challenged when it comes to us being connected because you got a time schedule in your mind. You have already written out in your mind, I get my degree, and then once I get a degree, I get my job, and then once I get a job, uh, I'll then uh, after about two years, I'll get married, and then after two years get married, I'm going to have two and a half kids, and we're going to live in the suburbs with a minivan and a white picket fence. But let me tell you something. God does not make decisions in your life based on your time requirements. He makes decisions in your life based on purpose requirements. Y'all not liking me here. And I submit, my brothers and sisters, that when he intervened in the life of Adam, when he was presenting Adam his rib, it was not based on the time. It was based on purpose. And whenever you operate in purpose, it may not go with your time schedule. It may not go with your proverbial clock. It may not go when others are getting it. But you want God to give you what's yours in your due season. And there's nothing worse than trying to get something prematurely and trying to do it your way and trying to make it your way and miss out on God's blessing just because you didn't get it in your timetable does not mean God is trying to withhold it from you. My brothers and sisters, my central aim today in this message is to challenge us because I meet so many people. I meet so many people, the Prince, who always talk about time as if to suggest God is not controller of time, as if to suggest that God that has made you wait, cannot circumvent and, and speed stuff up to make things happen according to his time place. God could care less about your plan. It's always about his purpose. So what do we see in this text? Let me share uh, some principles. Hopefully there's some who will listen and, and, and gravitate towards this because I wonder how many of us have made some mistakes and miscategorized ribs when they weren't really ours. How many of us have tried to move ahead of God and here you are years later disgruntled, mad, upset because you wanted your way like it's Burger King but if you would have just waited on God y'all ain't helping me and let God give you what deserves to be yours you'll have this moment. Let me share uh, some things here. Y'all sing, boy, let me share. I deal with marriage on next week. Notice what text says, first of all, is that when this concept of helper, this rib comes in, first thing the text tells us, how we can tell, is that God takes us to a period where we have to discern who is a suitable prospect. Notice verse 18, 19, and 20 uh, tells us God examining Adam in purpose notices that there's a deficiency Adam has. Adam is alone. Adam is singular. He's operating in purpose, but God understands that if I'm gonna, gonna up his purpose, I'm gonna give him someone to help him. But note what God does in Genesis 2, 18, 19, and 20. Before he gives him a suitable partner, he then brings animals in front of Adam. He now, says starts to form when you read the text, different classification of birds and livestock and fish. In other words, while Adam is in purpose, he begins to bring animals in front of Adam. And he tells Adam, Adam, name each animal. Uh -huh. Once again, he has power, authority, and dominion. So uh, when he puts the animals in front of Adam, Adam begins to name what he sees. That's a dog. Cat, cow, llama, shark, ostrich, eagle. For we don't know how long this goes on. We don't know how long he had to go through the naming process. But all we know is that whoever God brought to him, he named it. Which is interesting because I think it shares with us some powerful things because I submit that before God was confident that Adam would know what he needed, he needed to make sure Adam knew what he didn't need. Okay, y'all miss it. Um, in other words, he says, um, I need to see if there's discernment in Adam because 
Just because God brings them don't mean you have to claim them. Some that God brings is meant for you to name, not claim. I'm preaching better than y'all. I know it's early. Um, 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 and, and, and I know, I know you are so uh, one because the Lord done brought them. And you're so excited because the Lord done brought them. But everybody God brings to you is not meant to be your partner. And sometimes God wants to know, can you discern what you don't need before I can bring you what you do need? Y'all ain't helping me here. Oh, I see why some of y'all look mad and upset this morning because you claimed some stuff that you should have just named and kept it pushing. You uh, began to claim some stuff that God never intended to be a suitable partner for you. But because you just was in your mind and in your spirit, but if the Lord brought them, that must mean they're the one. No, just because the Lord brings them, according to our text, does not mean that they were intended to be your partner. Some people come so you can name them and move on. Y'all ain't helping me. May I submit, my brothers and sisters, that the naming Adam was doing was based on functionality. That he knew their function, therefore he could name it. So he can't get mad when what he names acts what he names. Okay. Um, why you gonna get mad? When a cat act like a cat, dog act like a dog, cow act like a cow, well act, come on, y'all ain't helping me to think. Maybe this is a better sermon for those in the later congregation, but I'm suggesting um, that here, God will oftentimes take us to the process of discernment that many times before he gets you to the place where you have what he wants for you, he wants to know how mature are you to be able to discern what is not good for you. And how many of us have settled for something because we the first thing that came, we just jumped up on it. First thing that showed up, we just said, well, I'm 30, so I guess this is it. I'm 32, I guess this is it. Well, I'm 45, and the rest of my friends are married. How many times have we made decisions and not everybody God brings is meant for you to partner with? And if I had time, if y'all didn't look so bored, I would tell you, um, don't get mad if what you name acts like what you've been calling it. Y'all ain't liking this. Make, the 945 is going to go crazy over that point. Okay, um, uh, um, I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, uh, is that what I'm suggesting in this moment that the opening portion in Genesis 2 allows us to understand that many times God does not bring what you need until you can discern what you don't need. This concept is not just discern what is a suitable part prospect, but also note in this passage that if you're to get your rib, you have to disengage from the sovereign process. Here's what's crazy about the text, is that after he tests Adam's discernment to see if he can choose between what's on his level and what's beneath him, he then puts Adam to sleep. Now, now this is where most of y'all are going to get upset because uh, according to scripture, uh, this concept of bringing Adam his rib did not involve any active participation of Adam. The main initiator, orchestrator of the whole process was God. Y'all. God puts Adam to sleep. God cuts Adam open. God takes out his rib. God closes up the womb. God fashions the rib. And then God brings her to Adam. In no place in the process is Adam actively engaged. This is going to mess with the common contemporary courtship concepts because many of us believe you got to be front and center to try to do it your way. And according to the scripture, how many of us have messed up because you're trying to do God's job and do it God's way? See, understand, he had to put Adam to sleep. 
See, by being asleep, being disengaged, by being, by slumbering, that when God brings to him this gift, Adam can't take no credit for what he got. And sometimes, for many of us, he needs to put us to sleep because too many of us are too active in the process. I'm trying hard. Y'all ain't helping me. Rod, give me some more, please. I, 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 so, so I put Adam to sleep. Then, watch this, he cuts him. Cuts him open, does surgery, takes the rib out. Then he closes up the wound. If I had time, I would tell you um, that that is important. Before he could bring Adam the rib, he had to heal Adam from what he did. Because he understands you can't receive if you're still hurt. And the reason why some of us struggle is because you try to do it. And you'll never have the power that God has to satisfy all your requirements that God says. Okay, um, here it is. All right, no, no what he says. It's, it's, it's interesting that God uses in this concept a real from the side. It's, it's important. Some of the Jewish rabbis suggested that that was significant because he didn't pull the woman from the head to be above him. He did not pull uh, the woman from the foot bone to be underneath him. did not pull him from the mouth bone to talk him to death. did not do any of that stuff. He pulled him the rib from the side. Now this is important because the sign is of equal partnership. Sign under the arm to be protected. The sign next to the heart to be loved. There was purpose in why he did it. But the rib is not just about the purpose and the placement that it came out of the side. Now understand the rib. Now if you begin to understand what the rib does, the rib is an important part of the body. Matter of fact, uh, it is made up of about uh, 12 bones, if you will. Matter of fact, the strongest bone in the body is connected to the ribs, the sternum. It controls or protects the, the most vital organs of humanity, the heart and the lungs. Matter of fact, the ribs is not just protecting your heart, but it also has to be able to allow you to breathe. The way it moves in and out is so that you can breathe. When you have hurt ribs or missing ribs, that means you are exposed and you cannot breathe properly. So when God is beating the rib, the side for Adam, what he's basically telling him is not just the placement, but understand what this rib represents. They will be your protection. They will be your support, they will be your connection, and they will help you to breathe. If they are your real rib, they will protect you, they will support you, they will help you breathe. Y'all ain't helping me here. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, guard your heart, because out of that comes uh, uh, the pain of life. 150 Psalm around verse 6 said, praise ye, let everything that have breath praise the Lord, which means as a believer, if your heart is not covered, if your lungs can expand, you cannot glorify God. A good way to know if they're your rib or not is do they protect you? Do they support you? Do uh, they connect you? Do they help you accomplish God's will for your life? Not just because they're cute. Not just because they got barbecue sauce on them. No, that's not the purpose of a rib. A godly rib is someone that can be down with you, can roll with you, can handle you, can support you you uh, and stay connected to y'all ain't helping me preach today the challenge of the text is that now he says there's purpose why I bring out the rib now this is interesting because here is the challenge notice when God starts fashioning up the rib he then fashions this rib for this Adam. He created a suitable companion that was comparable only to Adam. See, there's a misnomer. Many of us, we say cute stuff in church without understanding that what we're saying really don't make sense. So even the story of Ruth and Boaz, there's a whole thing, I want my Boaz. You can't have a Boaz. Boaz was Ruth's man. <laughs> so stop all that foolish mess. I want my Boaz. No. 
that's Ruth's man. What your prayer should be is, God, give me who you created for me. See, see that, that maybe that's the problem why we struggle is because you ain't got specificity. God does not create general blessings. God does not create abstract blessings. No, God is not just giving you a rib. He's giving you your rib. He's giving you what compliments you, which means what's for you is for you. What's for me is for me. You ain't got to compete with nobody because who God creates for you is for, I wish I had time. I wish I could preach it like I feel it at the 17 that too many of us are arguing over ribs that don't belong to us. Too many of us are arguing over people that was never meant for us in the first place. Your prayer should be, God, give me who you want me to have. Because every key don't fit every lock. Every puzzle piece don't fit every puzzle. And if you try to jam it to make it work, you're going to end up messing up key and lock and the whole entire puzzle. That's why the prayer should be, God, give me what you want me to have. I'm preaching better than y'all respond. I want me to talk about it. I'm trying to help you. Listen. That's why, that's why you can't get frustrated. Matter of fact, I always tell people, uh, the more specific the blessing, the longer the time. Go to a fast food restaurant. Make a special order. They don't just hand you your stuff. It's nothing more frustrating. Because you know how some of us pick it. Give me a uh, Big Mac, no lettuce, no middle bun, <laughs> half a thing of cheese, three onions, and two and a half pickles. Well, see, there's a standard Big Mac that they keep in the warm for people who just want something standard. But when you got specificity, when you got a special order, you don't just get that handed out the window. They tell you, hey, um, once your money, pull on up over here. We'll bring you, y'all ain't helping me here. That Maybe, maybe that's why some of us are still waiting. Maybe that's why some of us are just on the side. Act, touch your neighbor, say, neighbor, it's on the way. Stop, stop getting antsy. Stop being mad. Stop getting upset because other people are getting their food and driving all. No, baby, you got a special order. And when you got a special order, some stuff take longer than before. Here it is. Okay, y'all ain't liking this. Y'all want me to teach on it, but y'all don't want to hear me tell you. Okay, so, then notice what he said. Then afterwards, text says that after he goes away, he then comes back, wakes Adam up, and presents him the woman. Now, here is the trip, because for most people, y'all get too deep in who God sees. But Adam does not receive the woman based on revelation. He receives the woman based on recognition. Some of y'all too deep. Okay. Um, which means that when it's for you, you'll know. You'll be able to recognize it, and it's not going to be. Okay, y'all need some more scripture. Okay. Proverbs 31, y'all always like to quote that. He who findeth a good thing. All these Proverbs 31 women, I hear, you. I hear you. I'm worth rubies, okay. Read the whole thing. Read what she did. Waking them up early in the morning. She had a job, made sure the kids were fed. Man had support. Before you start claiming how you are a Proverbs 31 woman, read the requirements. But here's the truth, y'all. Check this out. That term findeth in the Hebrew does not mean seek. The term findeth in the Hebrew means he who recognizes a good thing. Y'all must It's Regardless if it's a good thing or not, what makes it the good thing for that person is that they have to recognize it. 
I'm preaching hard. Okay. Um, 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 you, he, God will bring it, put it in your face, but you got to acknowledge it. It's not the revelation. It's when you, you should know when you see it, the one that is out of you. I wish I had time. Okay. Um, okay, y'all look bored. Let me go and get through it. Okay. Sir, what is a suitable prospect? I'm telling you, this is going to kill the other congregation. Y'all just, y'all acting funny. Let's go. Got to disengage from the sovereign process. Because here it is. You got to then demonstrate a shameless partnership. This is what's crazy. So when, 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 when God brings her to him, the text says, he exclaims, woman. I had time, I will tell you, what I love about God in this text is if you notice, God creates man in one verse, but creates woman in six verses. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying. I'm really trying. I'm really I'm really trying. I'm really trying. I'm trying to help y'all. I'm trying. Brothers, I wish I could say it another way, but all I'm saying, <laughs> he breathed in us. But he did some special work. Okay, that's, that ain't for everybody. I got everybody ain't receive that. It blessed me if it ain't blessed nobody else. Okay. Um, he, he did special work. Uh, special six verses to create the woman. One verse for the man. And notice what he calls her. Woman. Isha in the Hebrew. Man means ish. In other words, since he knows what he's missing, when he sees it, he knows she comes from him. See, God created man, Adam, man of red from the ground. So the naming Adam means to come from the ground. That's what it comes. So his name was based on where he came from. So when he calls her one man, he's using the same work that God called him, saying he came from the ground, that when he saw his rib, his one man, his woe man, he said, she comes from me. His response was not a laissez-faire, it wasn't some just cool, oh yeah, that's the woman. The text exclaims that when he saw what was his, his response was rejoicing. Whoa, man. But understand with the woe man, his exclamation did not just come because of her. But his rejoicing came because he now understood and he trusted the integrity, the character, and the goodness of God. He realizes that I don't deserve this gift, but God, since you've been good to me, let me rejoice over the grace gift that you, not that I deserve it, not that I was in the process, not that I can put it on my resume, but Lord, when you give me what's mine, I can just honor you because of the gift you gave. I wish I had time. When was the last time you just got excited over the gift God gave you? When was the last time you got excited over the partner God put in your life? When was the last time you walked in the crib and said, oh, boy, thank to Jesus. I appreciate the gift you gave to me. Because in essence, what causes the rejoicing is he views her as a gift. Now, here it is. You ain't gonna like this. Even her imperfections were a gift. See, understand when you are made with someone, even what you don't like about them help to make you better. You can't sand anything with paper that doesn't have any grit on it. If you want to be polished, you need sandpaper. And some of the stuff we get mad about that causes tension is really God's gift to make us better. Um, that she was gifted to him, watch this, as something to make him better than what he already is. Which means that when I have that perspective, that you're not here to hurt, but here to help. I can appreciate the gift 
God gave me. Okay, then he moves. Uh, talks about in this text, this whole notion for that reason. He gives the marriage concept. Leave your mother and father and cleave to one another. He gives an important piece because now he's talking about this union. Understand the insertion given here by Moses uh, as he writes this uh, as a way to convey the reality of God was saying that when that one comes, you've got to leave your past and cleave to your present and future. That your spouse, the one, your gift becomes your number one priority. Even above your children. I'll deal with that next week. Notice text says they leave, cleave, and weave together. Then the text says that once that, now they can be naked and not ashamed. I'm done. I'll deal with this next week because I'm going to share with us when um, I talk about the covenant and how we see sin enter. Because one of the challenges you'll note, the only two institutions that were initiated before sin was marriage and Sabbath. Which is why we struggle with relationship and rest. So, if you note that what sin did was it disallowed us to operate in our nakedness and not be ashamed. You remember, when sin happened, they ran from God. Put on fig uh, leaves and, 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 and God, they said, why, why you got that on? They said, because we naked. And God said, who told you? You were naked. That sin penetrated the innocence that they could share in their transparency where they could expose themselves to one another and not be ashamed. But whenever that gets pricked and you lose transparency and can be open with one another, you then operate in a perspective of shame. But in order for there to be a shameless partnership, I need to be willing to be naked, flawed, and vulnerable, and trust that you will cover me, trust that you won't let evil come to me, trust that even though I have some imperfections, I can be honest with you and have no shame. Y'all ain't feeling me here when you know it's your rib is when you can be naked and not ashamed. Matter of fact, this is the good news, and I'm closing with this, is that all of us have purpose, all of us have assignment, and God will send you the help you need to accomplish his will. I'm done, everyone say. God is this my that's an interesting thought. I hope that helps. You know, when you start talking about relationships, and marriage and family, some of y'all be looking funny. I'm just going to help you with the Bible. I try to help myself. That's what I try. Because at the end of the day, God does not operate on time. He operates on purpose. Don't get ahead of God. Don't try to do God's job yourself. And don't raise your hand. Don't even blink at me. But how many of us have misdefined wrong ribs? How many of us have claimed who we should have just named and kept it pushing? How many of us have struggled because, Lord, if I just would have let you be in control, but I start looking at everyone else, I started judging my life based on them and what they could do and what they had. And so instead of operating in your timing for my life, I wanted to do, because I wanted to, to be in competition with someone else. You don't even know the personal pressure. Even for me, as a pastor, God saw fit to keep me single. I've got two churches. Most people will tell you that is an anomaly to get a church uh, single. I've done two of them churches I've gone. Matter of fact, rural churches, 99.7% of the pastors are married. But see, when God has a assignment on you, he does not place you places based on your status. He places you places based on his purpose. And of course you all get it. We, we, we all want those things that may seem prosperous to other people. We want the family. We want those things. And, and I've had to learn over these 37 years, God said, you know what? It's not your timing, it's my time. 
Because I had my stuff written down. If it was up to me, it'd been a long time ago. But God sometimes, when he knows how important your pr purpose is, he'll frustrate stuff. For no reason. To teach you, it ain't time yet. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. So, the question's raised, what do I do while I wait? Operate in purpose. Adam did not know he had a need because he was so steeped in his purpose. Adam did not know what he was missing it was God that said, you know what? Because I can trust him with this. I can now trust him with that. We're going to talk about next week, I'm going to talk about navigating the fall and how Adam and Eve wrestled in the covenant and perhaps look at some things that they could have avoided if they just would have communicated and did those things that allow sin, the serpent, to come in to what should have been a perfect union. We're going to deal with sibling rivalries. Cain and Abel had to go through this point and Cain had to wrestle with not feeling appreciated and not doing good enough. And, and if you're Abel, you're doing well and they still don't like you. And then we're going to close out talking about how do we move on from this? Abel gets killed. Cain gets marked. So now what is Adam and Eve going to do? In chapter, I think, 4 of Genesis says, and Adam and Eve came together and had Seth. And sometimes when you lose Abel and you lose Cain, you still got to move on because you got to produce Seth. So I want to deal with those. I hope that you walk with us. It's just a didactic teaching series, and I hope it's helpful. Our whole aim in May is to focus on family. I hope that you would make this a priority Bring your families at West on Tuesdays, here on Thursday. We got some incredible panels. Reverend Z has done a great job of programming things. We're really trying to make an emphasis on the family. I understand how important they are. So I believe, let's, can we do that? If not for any other time, you shouldn't make it a priority before, but any other time, make a priority. Say, I want to invest in my family. That's the whole aim we're going to try to do on Doors of the church is open. If there's one here today that's not saved, we invite you to come. If there's one here today that does not know Jesus, we invite you to come. If there's one today that does not have a right relationship with him, I want you to come. If you're here, I, I want you to step out by faith and, and uh, find God. If you're here, I want you to do that.